I'm Mike. I'm Jason. This is Snake Envy. And I'm Clint. We are very grateful to be here with Clint of Clint's Reptiles. We, before we dive into our topic, I think Jason has kind of a basic genetics question for you because he has a ton of experience as a breeder, but you come at it as an academic. Color morph genetics. Do you think everything is found and described and it's like we got a textbook and this is what we're going off of or do you think there's like some you know if ands and buts like this work this could come you know this doesn't work nor like a normal genetic Mm -hmm. i'm just gonna use an example a rusty a rusty is a gene and a color genetic in sonoran gophers it doesn't mesh with other colors, and so, like, <laughs> you can't mix them. In what way does it not mesh? So, like, you would, when you breed an anatheristic to an albino, mm-hmm. and when they both show up, you get a snow. Mm-hmm. This just shows up as rusty. It just doesn't show the other colors. It's like... So what do they what do they end up looking like? Just like the normal rusty, and then they even if even if it is anery and albino, is that what you're saying? Or yeah, so it's anery, albino, and rusty. The combination doesn't show up, like visually. But you know, you know, it is. I've known I've known that because I've sold them, and then I never produced the color more color combo I wanted to, and then all of a sudden I get people message and sent I, well I had one guy send me a picture and he goes I don't know what's up with the snake but it's always in the blue it looks mm-hmm. like it's always in the blue and that was the exanthic genetic coming through later on so <clears throat> so they had like adult onset yeah and, <laughs> and like I said that it doesn't mesh it does mesh but it just at a later stage I guess so as far as you know, if we all understand all of the genetics, um, we don't. Right. I think we've got a pretty good handle on, you know, the basic, the basics of inheritance. Um, you know, it, when it comes to like reptile breeding and stuff, anything that is controlled by a single gene, we usually have a pretty good handle on. Yeah. You know, it's it's basically either dominant to the wild type. Recessive to the wild type or incomplete dominant to the wild type and then they can also interact with other Morph alleles in a similar way like like lesser and Mojave are two different morphs right. um, They're they're both They're both forms of blue-eyed leucism and They together I mean you say, I guess they're similar enough that you end up with a blue-eyed leucistic. What would be a better example? Oh, um like the, the cow reticulated python, you know, that's two different blue-eyed leucistic morphs. But when you get one of each, you get this crazy uh, pattern where they, they develop more black spots as they age, okay. they come out leucistic. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways that uh, different morph alleles interact with each other too. You know, uh, yeah. Mojave and special, you get crystals and things like that in, in ball that- pythons. That stuff's over my head. The ball pythons. Oh yeah, yeah was, <laughs> but but it's it's the but same. Yeah. It it, work, yes, it all works the same. It's still a morph. There are a lot of things that you know we usually call like line bred traits that are controlled by a whole lot of genes, and it's just so complicated that we have a very difficult time understanding exactly what's going on, and because it's it's not just one pair, you know, a single gene, one pair of alleles involved it's a whole bunch of different genes at different places some of them might be functioning in a dominant way others in recessive way some in complete dominant with each other and you know if you start getting a bunch of them that all code for be really red over after a while you get something that's really red yeah. or, you know something like that and those are just more complicated than we can usually nail down it's not that we couldn't understand it at all but it would They're be very difficult to figure yeah. out okay i like that and I the the reason I just asked the question is is like because you people think everything's just black and white and it's the book's been written and there's and there's probably going to be more stuff discovered later on and we're just going to have to break it down and analyze it as we go I guess but I I know uh, one thing that I think 
I, I know I wasn't the first person that understood it, but I was the, I think I was the first person that understood it and then explained it to the reptile hobby. And I, it had been bothering me for a long time was how this gene in, in ball pythons works called banana. Oh. Uh, it was really weird. So they, they found a female, she, she was a banana, which, you know, they're very different looking from a typical ball python, very yellow. And as they age, they get black spots like a banana. And, and they found one female and they, you know, they, they bred her, and what, what they found was half the babies had the banana. So it, it's not recessive, because there's no reason to right. think that the, the, the male that they used was heterozygous for this brand new allele that had just come in. And, you know, so no, nothing seemed really weird. It was either dominant or it was incomplete dominant in some way. And, and then her sons hit breeding size first, and when they bred them, all of their daughters had this banana allele and none of their sons. With the females, when they finally hit breeding size, there was no difference, 50-50 males, 50-50 females. But, but that's the way it was with the males. And then all of a sudden, one, one of these males had a single son who had the banana, which that had never happened from a male before. One, one son got it. And then when he got old enough to breed, they started breeding him, and only his sons got the banana and none of his daughters, which is the opposite of what we'd seen before. Wow. And that was like, <laughs> what in the world is going on yeah. here? That's complex. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. that you know, and so, and so there, are, there are still mysteries. There's, there's uh, you know, um, what, do, what do they call them? I think they're chimeric individuals, but they call them paradox. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of, a lot of paradox only makes sense to me if it's a chimeric individual because you'll get like albinos that have patches of non-albinism and I wouldn't think that they would have the genetics to produce melanin in any patches in their body and yet they have patches of full normal melanin. Jason, Jason got, a, got a paradox this year out of yeah, nowhere. Yeah, the first year i ever seen, I didn't know, like I've never seen it happen in my collection before but I hatched an albino, albino white-sided bull and had a little patch about the size of a marble that was orange. It was just, it would, the white side gene wasn't there. It was just the albino showing in that patch. And it was, and it was okay, so it's a, it was an albino white side and it was suddenly not white side. And just, white side's recessive, right? Yeah. So it shouldn't have those genetics. But, and this is, this is a test of my hypothesis right now. Um, at least one of the parents wasn't a white side, correct? I'm gonna have to go look. That would that would be great because I can tell because 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 like I would hypothesize that you would never get a a paradox albino out of a cross of two albino parents. Uh, you know, I think in order to get a paradox albino, what you have to have it is most likely was something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so that that would be a good test because if they're both white sides, then it would it would actually throw a lot of my my uh, hypothesis on this into chaos so I would be interested in, in finding <laughs> yeah. out about that later well, and I've heard a lot of that stuff isn't like inheritable but we're going to find out it eventually. shouldn't be but this is, this is the you thing that gets know, me right? well, this, this is the big thing and you know sometimes people pay a lot for paradox snakes and the thing is you know what I'm pretty sure is going on with the paradox snake is you had twins and and they, they essentially, they grew together in sort of the same way when you get two-headed snakes. Um, but one of them was largely just absorbed by the other. Okay. Except for little patches that are the, you know, and, and you could, well, one thing, because the, uh, the, the banana is on sex-determining genes, you know, one thing I would be really interested in is just sequencing the DNA from scales from patches with banana and patches without to see if they're even the same mm. sex. Wow. Because they should be not the same sex. Okay. And but something that I always find really interesting about paradoxes is there's the chance that you have a male. There is the chance that that male snake has testes that are from the snake that you're hardly even seeing expressed in the pattern. And wow. so it might not breed right for the dominant color that you're yeah. seeing. Potentially, odds yeah. are it will. Because it's probably just a little piece of the other one. That is the last thing that I would have thought paradox <laughs> could be. It would be absorbed twin. <laughs> I never would have guessed. But that that's an amazing theory. We we will. We'll have to look into it further. Yeah. And he and he's gonna see if 
if that paradox can be proven out, if it's genetic. And I mean, every species acts different, so you never know. Wow. When in both color morphs, so. So let's get into our main topic, and you're no longer Clint of Clint's Reptiles. Now you're Dr. Clint Laidlaw, PhD. Oh, We're going to dive. The, that's, We're, is that a nerdy or less nerdy <laughs> version of Clint from Clint's Reptiles? <clears throat> Only you can say. Yes. Um, but we're going to dive into taxonomy. We do a segment on our channel called Genetics Lingo, and we try to cut through some of the confusion of all these genetic terms. Between the two of you, you've just uttered about six of them <laughs> in the last two minutes, and sometimes they can all be very confusing. So we do that segment. So today we're going to take a broader approach. We're going to talk about taxonomy. And this is right in your wheelhouse, of course. Do you like doing that? You do taxonomy on your channel on a regular basis. So let's start with what is taxonomy in general? And there's also multiple types. So how is phylogenetic taxonomy, for example, different than standard taxonomy? Okay, so taxonomy is essentially just a way of organizing life in a way that is somehow useful. And, and there are lots of ways that you can organize anything that are can be somewhat useful. You know, like like say you get your Legos out, you know, you could you can organize them by color, you could organize them by basic size, you could organize them by shape. And all of those would have value. Maybe you could organize them by color, size and shape. And, you know, and then they'd really be quite organized. And, you know, and and then and probably what you'd want to do, you know, if you were going to organize your Legos, you might, you know, start off going, "Okay, well, I'm going to get all of the individuals that, or all, all of them that are uh, purple. And that's a big box of purple Legos. And then I go, okay, and I'm going to now get the ones that are just regular bricks. And I'm going to put those in a box and I'm going to get some that are like specialty pieces. And then within the regular bricks box, I've got, you know, two by four pieces and I've got two by two pieces and I got two by three pieces and I've got two by six pieces. And, you know, and each of those is in a different box within the bricks box, within the purple things box. And the other one, you know, it's specialty pieces and it's like pieces I can use in rocket ships. And I don't know, you know, and I've got boxes within boxes. And, and as I get into the smaller and smaller boxes, they're getting more and more precise as to what they are. And the bigger boxes are very general and the boxes fit within bigger boxes. And that would be very useful in a lot of ways. In that it, it helps me keep track of things. It helps me maybe notice some things, but, but one thing that it doesn't really do for me is it doesn't teach me anything about those organisms that I didn't know before I put them in the boxes. I, you know, I, I needed to know all of this, the criteria about it to tell you which box it would go into. And, and that, so that, that has its use, but it's not super useful. It's just like an organizational system for finding things. It doesn't teach me anything I didn't already know. Which is why phylogenetic taxonomy has been so much better. And in fact, today, you know, we still have these like discrete Linnaean categories, you know, the kingdom phylum, right. uh, all of that. And, and we're so used to having those that we still kind of try to rescue those, <laughs> those terms for things. It's just life doesn't function in discrete boxes. Life's kind of a continuum. Um, and, and so, you know, you could make an infinite number nearly. You, you could, let's put it this way. You could make a box for every generation of life in any given lineage, uh, at the very least. And they could all, they could go into just, you know, millions where, of boxes. Where, where does the taxonomy begin, by the way? Is there, is there a category called life on earth or mm -hmm. is it already split into boxes? Yeah, I, I would say that, I would say that generally speaking, the biggest category that may exist would be probably cellular life. Cellular life, okay. Um, which is to separate cellular life from things that are kind of like quasi-life forms that are non-cellular, like viruses or fire, <laughs> robots. Yeah. You know, there are, there are things that are like, have some of the attributes of what we would usually consider to be life, but not quite all of them. And cellular life forms you know, it, 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 is, it is plausible, at the very least, that cellular life has one single origin. Possibly. It could have more. Right. It could have multiple 
early origins. That's totally possible also. Um, but, but, but so the biggest possible category would be that there is one group of all of cellular life. And, and then that, that group of all of cellular life in the fairly early days of life appears to have split into two big lineages, uh, which are the bacteria and the archaea. The cell could get a lot bigger, it could develop a lot more complexity, and that is the origin of the eukaryotic cell, eukarya, which includes the protista, which I would say is only a group if we are part of it, because there's three different lineages that have popped up within the protista that are very, very multicellular, which would be the, the plants, the animals, and the fungus. Plants and, plants and fungus are more closely related to each other than they are to plants, but neither of them are each other's closest relatives. They, multicellularity is just multiple eukaryotic cells working together and in, a, in, a, in there getting more specialized. And anyway, from there came the eukarya. So those would be... And I promise you, on, 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 we're on gonna, and we're, on and we're on. We're going to get to snakes. Yes, yes, yes. Well, we can, <laughs> we can keep working our way up. Uh, but but the, thing, the thing about it is... You know, it's so. So we've got this one big group, which is called a clade. A clade is a common ancestor in all of its descendants. So we've probably potentially just got this one original clade, and then you know that clade split into two clades: the bacteria and the archaea. And within the archaea came out a new clade, the eukarya. And so there can be groups within bigger groups within bigger groups. Right. You can never evolve out of a group. You're always part of that group, even though you might be very different from what the rest of the group is like after a while, and very different from what your shared ancestor was like. But you've got this continuous branching within. And, and one of the really powerful things about phylogenetic taxonomy is that when, when well, we can, we can figure out where something goes in there very simply. I don't need to know about all the boxes. In fact, you know, for a while I was trying to use morphology, which, you know, I think we've got some morphology here, which was the best tool that we had for figuring out where things go in the phylogeny of life. But there's a downside to that, which is sometimes there are attributes of an animal that are really conspicuous to us. And sometimes they have to do with, you know, things that it needs to do in its environment that require strange adaptations. And, and those really strange things about it tend to stick out to us. So I might see something like a marsupial mole and a golden mole and a mole. And I might look at those three mammals and I might go, those are the same. Because they're, they're really the same in some really conspicuous ways. They got these like skin covered eyes that these big old digging feet really reduced ear. I mean, they're, they're just shaped like a little torpedo with giant digging claws out front. They look almost identical. And so, and I'm really going to notice those weird features that are all the same on those, not necessarily because of how they're related to each other, but just because of the fact that they both live, or the, all three of them live similar lives. Right. In most ways, they're not the same. But they sure look the same when I yeah. first see them. And, and in, in sort of recent decades, we've had a new and really powerful tool, which is DNA. And, and that's Jason's question. And so you can learn things about organisms that you didn't know when you put them in the box from where they are in the phylogeny of life. And so phylogenetic systematics, phylogenetic taxonomy, has so much more predictive power than any other organizational system we've ever had for life. Well, since we learned about DNA and taxonomy, how much has that changed our thought process and what have we learned from that? Is that, that that's a good question. So 